All right, uh, welcome to this video uh, where we're going to talk about uh, approximation of summations using uh, integration. Uh, this is uh, another technique that we can use, especially if the function uh, that we're summing over is easy, easily integrable. Uh, in this case, uh, the uh, solution we get, the approximation we get, as we'll see in a bit, is actually a much tighter approximation than the technique we were using in the last two videos. Uh, so sometimes uh, when, we're, when we're doing an approximation, trying to find a bound on a summation, uh, the techniques that we uh, um, have at hand uh, in just simple approximations might, uh, might give away too much uh, and therefore we might not get uh, uh, as close an approximation as we need. If that's the case we might say well we have another tool in our toolkit which is integration and let's see how that's going to work for us as well. General, I'm going to start with a function here f, f of i. Uh, we're summing over the index i uh, so this function f of i is dependent on i, presumably. Uh, but here we're, we will consider any uh, particular function, though we will probably restrict ourselves to runtime functions as they're the most common uh, in, in computer science. Uh, but uh, to sort of maybe uh, put our calculus hat on for a second, um, maybe it's not just a runtime function we're interested in, but we're going to be looking at one here uh, that is non-decreasing over the interval that we're interested in. And that's usually going to be true for our runtime functions. Remember, um, most runtime functions are non-decreasing, at least over the positives or at least over the range that we're interested in. Uh, so assume we have a non-decreasing function here, uh, f of i, and if you want to fill in for a particular function in a second, we're going to use i squared. Uh, but we could use, um, you know, 2 to the i, uh, any, you know, uh, log i, any increasing function uh, that is a good representative of a runtime function. Uh, okay, so say we have this function, we now want to approximate it. I have the rule uh, stated here, but maybe let's uh, look at how this rule, how we can come to this rule or come to realize that this rule uh, holds. So here, uh, in my depiction here, uh, I've uh, drawn myself uh, a line here. Uh, this line, let's imagine it's some kind of function. Well, this, uh, this line then is going to be our f of i. And maybe for now, uh, this one looks like maybe it's a, it's a 2 to the i, uh, or maybe it's an i squared, something like that. Kind of has that shape. At least that's what I intended it to look like. If we go back to our sum, our sum actually is the sum uh, i equals k uh, to n of our f of i. So if this function f of i here, if this this graph plots this function, then this sum is asking us, because we're actually summing over integer values here, it's asking us to sum the area of each of these rectangles that I've drawn here. Now here I've simplified things and assumed my k is 1. Okay, So assuming we're starting at 1 here. Um, so let's just verify that um, f of 1 then, according to my graph, is, is this point here. Um, and assuming this is 1 wide, then the area of this little rectangle will be equal to this value. And then likewise here at the next point, again if this is 1 unit wide, then the area of this rectangle will be equal uh, to the height of this, the function here. This will be f of 2 then. And so we've got f of 1, f of 2, uh, f of 3, 4, 5, 6. Um, so the area of all six of these rectangles together is the sum that we're looking for. Okay, so that's the first thing. And, and the other thing I'll, I'll uh, mention is you'll notice these black rectangles that I have here as well that I haven't actually filled in, but if you look at them, they're the exact same rectangles just shifted to the left uh, by one unit. So the sum that we're trying to calculate, the question that we have before us is to, to basically calculate the area of these rectangles. Now this is where integration is going to become handy. Remember that uh, the, the integral, the integration, one of the things it's going to do, the definite integral in particular, uh, over a, a region, um, say in this case, 
uh, maybe from 0 uh, to n, if we took the definite integral, that would tell us the area of the shape formed underneath the curve and with the axes. So we get this nice sort of shape here. Now, of course, uh, that's going to give us precisely that, that area, which is, which is great. Okay, we, that's what calculus is useful for. And we can see here that let's do the area from 0 to n. This area here. I've drawn it such that it, we can see that it is less area than the rectangles because the rectangles I've drawn here are always above this little these little chunks above the line are parts we haven't counted in the integral so if we use the integral here and we do the definite integral from 0 to n okay, then the line, the area that we get from that is less than the sum of all of our rectangles and that's our first that's the, the first rule that we're going we're gonna to apply here so here, um, in, in our example, we went from 0 to n. Well, in, and remember, our k was 1. So we actually need to go from k minus 1 up to n. And that's going to be uh, an underestimate or a lower bound uh, on our sum. All right, so what about the upper bound? Well, we can probably imagine the upper bound works very similarly. In the upper bound case, uh, we have uh, all we've done now is we're going to say the area of the curve now from 1 to, well, the curve goes off here, but n plus 1. If we go from 1 to n plus 1, now the area under that curve is greater than the sum of all six of our rectangles. So just by moving that those indices over by 1 from 0 to n to 1 to n plus 1, or if we let k be back in there, we'd have k minus 1 to n and then k to n plus 1. If we do that, if we just shift it to the right, we now uh, have an overestimate. Uh, okay, now this worked because the function that we have here is increasing or non-decreasing. Um, if we actually uh, shift the, the function around, so that it's backwards now, uh, our rectangles uh, swap sides. Uh, what was once an upper bound is now a lower bound. Uh, so we can, again, sort of see that here uh, in our slides uh, with our opposite rule that if we have a, a non-increasing function instead, uh, we, can, we can see here that uh, this integral has swapped to the other side and vice versa. Um, our upper bound has become our lower bound, our lower bound has become our upper bound. Now that works if we now have a non-increasing function, i.e. a decreasing function. And remember, decreasing functions are not representative of runtime functions, so we're less likely to encounter those. Uh, most of the time, we are going to be in this case here, where we encounter these non-decreasing functions. Or, more strictly speaking, increasing function is more likely what we're going to encounter. Let's uh, do an example. Uh, using integration. And let's apply it to one of the uh, functions we've already looked at uh, to see how it impacts our, uh, our approximation. All right, I want to use uh, the function uh, i squared I mentioned before. We've actually already used a technique uh, to approximate i squared, the sum of i squared. Um, and we approximated it uh, above and below. Uh, and if you recall from the last video, our approximation above was just n, n cubed, sorry, not n squared, n cubed. And our approximation below uh, was one eighth of an n cubed. So let's keep that in mind while we uh, uh, try and apply this other technique, the approximation by integrals, and see, you know, does this give us a better approximation uh, or a worse one? All right, so let's take a look. Now, when we do approximation by integrals, the one uh, benefit of doing that is we only have to carry out the integration once. Uh, that is, uh, once we know what the uh, integral is, then we can just do two definite integrals, which just means substituting in um, different variables. Uh, so we're going to do the upper bound here, and again, maybe double checking our notes. We note that we want to go from index 1, which is our starting index, but up to uh, index n plus 1. 
Uh, so we're going to do that, and here we're going to take the integral of, uh, I've converted it into the variable x now for integration, uh, x squared dx. Uh, and again, uh, doing a quick integration here, we know of course that that's going to give us um, x uh, cubed over 3. I have included the constants here, but in the definite integral, those constants are going to cancel out for us. Uh, so, uh, uh, again, the integration gives us uh, an x cubed over 3, uh, but the definite integral, we're going to plug in uh, our n plus 1 in the first case. We're going to get n plus 1 cubed over 3 plus our constant. And then we minus out uh, what we have on the bottom. Uh, and in the bottom case, we have uh, 1 cubed, so plugging in again, 1, 1 cubed over 3 again, minus c, the plus c and the minus c cancel out, uh, so that gives us our, uh, this is just simplifying the equation, here I've just expanded uh, this binomial, this is a pretty easy one to remember, if you uh, remember that this follows the uh, binomial uh, coefficients, uh, or Pascal's tri triangle, so since we're rise, raising it to the third power, the coefficients will be 1, 3, 3, 1. And of course, here I've just cubed uh, 1 uh, to simplify here. All right, uh, uh, just uh, canceling and gathering our terms a little bit. I uh, will notice that we had a 1 third minus, a 1 third that cancels out. Uh, and canceling out our threes as well, make things a little bit simpler. Uh, and this is a pretty close approximation, at least this is better than what we had before. Remember, this is an upper bound. So because this is an upper bound, uh, uh, we've now said that the sum here is upper bo uh, bounded above by a third of an n cubed, a third of an n cubed, plus a little bit more, an n squared and an n. Now, let's compare that to our case here. Uh, this is uh, what our approximation was using the uh, uh, splitting the sum and binding the term method we over approximated by a whole n cubed. So actually we've got a, a much closer approximation now where we presume we have because it's a smaller upper bound. Instead of a full n cubed we have about a third and a little bit more. So we've kind of shaved off almost two-thirds of an n cubed. That's quite a lot. Okay, Not completely all of that though. Uh, and Maybe there's going to be an important reason why that is and, and, and maybe let's go on and we'll compute the lower bound as well. Uh, the lower bound, not, not too tricky, since we've already computed the uh, integral, uh, again, x cubed over 3, uh, we just now have to compute a different definite integral. So let's take a look at our, our uh, lower bound. And I've switched the direction here. We're now doing a lower bound. Uh, and remember, on the lower end, we're going to decrease this index by 1 instead of increasing this one by 1. So we now go from 0 to n. That actually makes things a lot easier since the plugging in the zero is just going to give us zero. Um, and also plugging in the n actually makes things easier too. So remember our integral was x cubed over 3. So plugging in our n we get n cubed over 3. Again our c's are going to cancel out here. Um, and we just had a zero there. So this is actually just an n cubed uh, over 3. Again maybe comparing uh, using our splitting the sum method we uh, used we came to the approximation of one eighth of an n cubed well we've got a better approximation now which is one third of an n cubed um, and the one third of an n cubed uh, again uh, comparing that to our our previous uh, example let's just go back a little bit uh, our upper bound was an n cubed plus n squared plus n so sorry one one more time. It's one third of an n cubed plus n squared plus n. That was the upper bound. Our lower bound was just an n cubed or one third of an n cubed. So um, let's compare our two comparisons here. Uh, in our two techniques, we've we've got these two different bounds. Uh, using the splitting the sum technique, we didn't get a very tight, or it's still a tight bound, but it's not as close. The constants involved are, are more distant between a 1 8 and a full n cubed. Um, but using integration, we've been able to close those bounds down. Now they're both look like they're about a third of an n cubed. That's good. So our guess is the sum is probably right around a third of an n cubed. And it's got to be somewhere between 
uh, exactly one third of an n cubed, that's our lower bound, uh, and n a third of an n cubed plus this n squared plus n. Now, I think I mentioned in a previous video that we actually do have a closed form expression for this, and it's not one that I've been I've memorized, but I do have it included here on the slides. We can see that the exact form, the exact sum of these uh, rectangles that we're looking for, is one third of an n cubed plus half of an n squared plus a sixth of an n. So our over, we definitely needed that little wiggle room in our upper bound uh, above our our, n, our third of an n cubed. Um, be, but we got really close here. Our, our using the technique of integration has got a real nice tight fit close approximation to the sum and so a lot of times if, if what we need is something that's very close um, integration is the tool that we're going to use. Um, if you also feel that integration is a tool that you're comfortable with a lot of the runtime functions we're going to run into are not very challenging for integration so you can use this uh, for any uh, function that you run into um, but uh, keep in mind if, if you're going to use splitting the sum and binding the term uh, most of the time uh, you might want to use integration uh, when you need a real tight close approximation and we'll see one example of that in a future video uh, but I'm going to uh, end this video here um, uh, I'm going to recommend please join us again in the next video uh, where we're going to start talking about recursive analysis alright thank you and see you in the next video